Welcome back, everybody. It is time for another installment of Friday Q&A. Thanks, as always, for this week's questions. If you have questions for next week's Q&A, get them in the comments below. If you want to support the channel, there are links to my music in the video description. Alternatively, you can get some access to some exclusive content, including tab backing tracks and lessons by following the link to my Patreon in the video description. Let's get into this week's question, starting with the question I had about this guitar. This is a PV Wolfgang special with some uh, very custom googly eyes that I put on there. And this guitar was an absolute steal. I bought it from a guy locally. Um, great price. The guitar's in great condition. It plays so easily. The neck's really nice and small and just kind of speedy, which I like, and it's really lively. Harmonics fly off it. It is an absolute pleasure to play. It totally puts me in that high octane 80s kind of mood. So we're going to see this guitar today, and I'll talk about uh, the ragdoll gig that I did with this guitar because I have done exactly one ragdoll gig with this guitar. We did a show where we played our entire back catalogue. So I had this guitar as my kind of main backup, but I did play it for a bunch of songs in the set. I actually had it in, well, I call it standard, but really it's standard a whole step down, basically not drop C, so to just be D standard for some of the really old ragdoll songs like In My Mind and The Feeling and a few songs like that that aren't in drop C. So I use that for uh, all of that. And it was really quite a nice change going from the single cut, which you know is lighter than my Les Pauls, but it's still not super light guitar, whereas this is a very light guitar. You can kind of throw it around and jump around with it, and it's almost not there, and it is just so speedy and fast. So it's pretty enjoyable to do that. We haven't done another show like that since where we've played everything, uh, so I've just kind of stuck with the single cut, but I'm sure at some point this guitar will see another live outing. In 2015, I think, me and some buddies of mine did a King Diamond Merciful Fate tribute night, and I used this guitar uh, for that gig, just for the big 80s kind of tones that you need for some of that stuff. And it was it was awesome. It made that gig a whole lot easier than using like a Gibson or something like that, just because, again, there's a, there's a lot of fast picking stuff in a lot of that, and this guitar makes it super duper easy. All right, there's the questions about the Wolfie answered. I will play this throughout the video. There was a question from last week about the nut on my blue PRS Custom 24 and what I've done to it. It is not an expensive mod at all. All I did was uh, cut some packing foam. You know the stuff you get when you buy like a Seymour Duncan pickup? Uh, I just took that and I cut it up and I placed it uh, kind of on the dead string length here and on the trem springs back there because I used that guitar on our European tour and I had my Axe FX dialed in for my single cut, which obviously doesn't have a trem. And I was getting just like a little bit of extra noise that I wasn't used to. And it was literally just the trem springs kind of, you know, resonating and making a little bit of extra sound and setting the gate off. So uh, I did that and it stopped it. And I've had that guitar the same way ever since, used it on that tour. And we've done some stuff on the East Coast here in Australia where I use that guitar. And it's, a, uh, it, again, it just works. And now it's even quieter with that little modification on there. I'll answer one more question about some PRS stuff and then I'll play this thing. Uh, should you save up for a core model or should you just go out and grab an SE? And this question also related to like the difference between the different tiers they have and things like that. Back in my day, uh, there were, you know, when I was kind of growing up worshipping PRS guitars like I still do, uh, I remember when the Santana and the Tremonti SE models came out, and I thought they were really cool. They're, you know, still, I would still recommend to a lot of people, if you like rock or metal and you don't want to spend a lot of money, grab a secondhand Tremonti SE and put your favorite pickup in it and then, you know, go and play some music. They are uh, excellent guitars for the money in that like sub $1,000 range. Um, that's where I would be looking. Having said that, PRS do the CE, which is a bolt-on neck American-made guitar. So now we have like, uh, you know, they have the core and the S2 models. Back in the day, it was just, you know, the USA PRS guitars. So the CE models are very, very cool. Uh, they have a slightly different thing going on than the customs because of the set neck, but um, 
you can normally get them for an absolute bargain. The same goes for the Custom 22. Custom 22s sell used for a lot cheaper than Custom 24s or Makati's, and they're fantastic guitars. So if you can put the scratch together and find a good deal on like a used CE or a used, you know, if you want the kind of twang thing, a Swamp Ash Special, they always seem to go for decent prices used. Or what I have right here, I know I said I was going to play this guitar, but uh, here's one that I prepared earlier. In my opinion, one of the most underrated PRS guitars, uh, the US Mira. This one is from 2008. I've talked about this one on the channel before. Uh, but this sounds mega. This is like 95% there in terms of my single cut. So let's hear this thing. You can hear the difference from that to the Wolfie right now. So yeah, uh, keep your eye out for something like a Mirror or a Custom 22 or a CE. And uh, you know, if you've got guitar wall hangers, put your guitars on the wall hangers. Don't just like leave them leaning against the speaker like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Totally different animals. They're both great. That thing is way chunkier. This one just kind of has way more of that mid-range scream. All right, what was the song that made me want to play guitar? Big question. And I would say there was actually probably, let's say three songs that I could identify immediately that made me really want to pick up a guitar and play. Um, the first one was Stairway to Heaven because, you know, that was the first song I ever actually learnt how to play on guitar. And funnily enough, my younger sister had been doing guitar at school and she had like a transcription of this song and there was a guitar kicking around the house and I was like, oh, I think I understand what that is. And I started really getting into it when I was probably about 13 years old. And then I heard Thin Lizzy and that first chord in Jailbreak, you know, this. <laughs> Whatever the note that they bend, I should probably uh, put a bit more time into researching that, seeing as it was so fundamental and important. And then that whole album, Live and Dangerous, just takes off. And, you know, from then on, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, after that, I will probably say, um, and it probably wasn't that long after that, I watched uh, the Gary Moore, the After Hours, whatever the VHS that goes along with that. And that just blew my face off. It was the most amazing live guitar playing I'd ever seen. And there wasn't like really a particular song on there, but I would probably say his version of um, Walking By Myself, just the solo he plays on it is dynamite. So they're definitely three songs that when I started out really kind of lit a fire under me and uh, made me want to play. There was um, probably Scuttle Button by Stevie Ray Vaughan was another big one, hearing that, hearing just that like pure aggression. And uh, I mean, I said three, let's do five. Probably the first time I ever heard Ingbe, which would have been uh, You Don't Remember, I'll Never Forget, because that just, that was a whole new universe of things to do on the guitar. So uh, yeah, let's, let's say those five songs were the one thing that made me really, really want to play guitar. Uh, all right, I talked last week about a rig for 1200 US dollars, what would I do? And it was mentioned more than once in the comments that uh, if you've got that sort of budget, buy used gear. So what would my recommendations be for a used rig around that. Uh, in this case, there is that higher variability where you might get really lucky and, you know, someone's selling a, you know, a core PRS for $700 or something, um, or a US Strat or, you know, an SG or something like that. Um, but I would generally try to find a, you know, a decent uh, PRS SE, if you can. The SE245s are really, really good for the money. Somebody mentioned Schecter guitars. They definitely do some good stuff as well. Uh, the ESP and LTD stuff 
as well. Or if you can find a used Hamer guitar, my Hamer Special, I think I paid 400, 450 US dollars for um, like six or seven years ago because it had a headstock repair. So let's say that and then, you know, pair that with like a Jet City Amps JCA 50H um, with a Jet City cabinet or something like that. And then you can buy, you know, a Boss Tuner and a Boss SD1 and a Boss DD3 or something and kind of round everything out there. So, or a Marshall DSL would be a great amp to look at or a used ADA MP1 with some kind of power amp. Or, you know, if, if it works out, look at something like, if you want to go the modeling route, you could do a first gen Axe FX or you could do something like the HX Stomp or the Pod Go. Uh, all of those are excellent options. Um, but yeah, there's just, that becomes a whole different universe and you can look at reverb prices, but uh, you know, that's uh, always so variable to me. You see things and it's like, oh, cool. You know, this month the DSL 50 is worth $300, but next month it's worth $900. So uh, yeah, take that with a grain of salt and you can definitely kind of shop around. Oh, I will say as well, one piece of gear that you can definitely get really cheap, the PV6505 1x12 combo. That was my touring rig for like four or five years in the States and those things are awesome. <laughs> Speaking about Jet City amps, uh, I know I just mentioned them, but there's a couple of videos on my channel comparing the JCA 50 to my Soldano Hot Rod 50, which you can check out and hear exactly for yourself. But I will say the Ragdoll song, Break You, we were tracking guitars for that and we had a bunch of amps in the studio and, you know, it's, it's very much inspired by the late 80s, you know, Winger, Blue Murder, those kind of things. So. I naturally thought we'll use the Soldano on this song and we shot out the Soldano against the Jet City and we actually went with the Jet City. So that guitar sound that you hear on Break You, I'm pretty sure it's the JCA 50 with my Les Paul standard for a set of doubles. And then I was borrowing a Jeff Beck Strat into a DSL. So DSL, JCA um, with those two guitars and that's the guitar sound on Break <laughs> On that note about dual amps, using dual amps in the Axe FX 3, I actually did exactly that for the guitar sounds on the latest Ragdoll single, Follow the Leader. Again, you can go and check that one out or you can use the Bandcamp link and if you've got a dollar to spare, you can buy the single and have a listen to it for yourself. But what we did there with the guitars, that from memory is the Bogner Überschall model together with the Cameron Atomica model. And it's both of those each into their own IR. And that's kind of the core guitar sound. It's doubled. I think the last chorus, we tracked an extra double or something like that just to fatten it up. But uh, yeah, I, I really liked that. It's definitely something that I'm going to experiment a bit more as we record some more tracks. And what I liked about that was <clears throat> those two amps really complement one another. So you could try mixing things like for a really heavy sound, try a rectifier and a Mark series amp, or try, you know, for a classic rock thing, try like a Fender Deluxe Reverb or a, an AC30 model together with a Plexi, or for a clean thing, try, you know, a Dumble Clean with the USA Lead or something like that, and just kind of get these complementary tones blending together. What I did notice was that if I ran dual amps into a single cabinet IR, I didn't like it as much as choosing individual IRs to match the amp. So that would be my one tip right there if you wanna play around with it. Speaking of like having an Axe FX and having amps, advice, you know, in terms of like selling your gear, if you get an Axe FX and you love it, should you sell all your amps? Uh, that is 
really a personal thing to go through. You know, for me, I love these amps that I've got here, obviously, and I have my total vanity rack full of ADAs and, you know, Mesa preamps and things like that. The reality is, is I play my Axe FX3 every single day for several hours a day, uh, whether I'm practicing, whether I'm recording, whether I am doing this or whether I'm teaching. And it's just an invaluable piece of gear. I love the way it sounds. I use it live as well. And the amps, I turn on, you know, once or twice a week and I'll do some videos with them or I'll just wind them right up and make my pants flap. But that is just not a sustainable thing for me. You know, it's a... Uh, just it's literally not good for your health just to play those loud amps. I do like running them into a load box to record with, uh, but honestly, I'd like my sound. I know how to get the sound in my head out of the Axe FX a lot quicker. Whereas I find these amps, they have a distinct character, and that's a def that's definitely a cool thing. Uh, it gives you kind of puts your sound on rails. Like if you're playing through a dual rectifier, that dual rectifier doesn't sound like any other dual rec I've played. So kind of why I keep it when I want that very particular character. It's like a tool, whereas the Axe FX just gives me all the tools and uh, it's it's incredible. Same thing for pedals, like the drive block update in there. Um, I use the drives in there more than I ever used real drive pedals. So yeah, if you, if you like it as much as I do and um, you don't have the sentimental value attached to your amps, you probably will want to sell some of them. Um, but definitely try them first. Don't like sell your amps to buy an Axe FX. Um, if you can afford to have both, test them, live with them, and then, you know, make the decision that you're going to make. <laughs> Little bit out of tune there, just a tiny little bit. Sir guitars, amazing. Uh, my little anecdote about Sir guitars uh, in 2013, the first time I ever went to New York, I spent a week there with a good friend of mine, and I had a whole bunch of time to you know just look at guitars. And uh, where'd I go to? Sam Ash, and that was amazing. They had this new shipment of Sir guitars in there, and I think it was probably like during the day on a Tuesday. <clears throat> And I was in there trying them out. And one other guy came in to this room and he was, <clears throat> I think he was from Brazil. And we hung out for like an hour and we had a great time checking out guitars. And he was there like to buy a guitar. Um, and then it was really funny where he said to me, he's like, I want you to play them. And then I'm going to choose them that way so that I can just sit back and listen to the one that sounds the best. So... Um, I can't remember if he bought one or not, but yeah, I played so many of them. Looking back, the Australian dollar was above parity then. That actually would have been a really good time to buy one because the Australian dollar is very much not at parity. So uh, the prices are steep at the moment, but they deserve their reputation. Sirs are incredible, incredible instruments. Um, you know, to me, if you want the ideal Strat style guitar, it's probably a Sir. If you want the ideal Les Paul style guitar, it's probably a PRS. Uh, if you disagree, let me know in the comments. Of course. All right. And one last question. Uh, this isn't really a question, more a comment. Like, am I a gear hoarder? And will I do a video series of um, confessions of a gear hoarder? My wife's sitting right here and she's nodding her head right now. So I think that's a, I think that's a solid yes. That's a solid yes, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a gear hoarder, even though I've sold heaps of gear recently, I'm still a gear hoarder. I'm looking around and yeah, it's, um, you know, I justify it by the fact that like, I don't drink and I don't take drugs and I don't do a bunch of stuff, but really it's still ridiculous. It's still no excuse, you know? But having said that, these are, these are really nice machines. I'm going to play them. Get your questions for next week in the comments. And um, yeah, I'm just uh, going to continue being a gear hoarder. Play some guitar with lots of delay and wah because uh, that's, that's what you like to hear, isn't it? <laughs>